So, all right. So welcome to our third installment of our Fall Carolina Canopy webinar series. Um, today's topic, mitigating urban heat islands with trees. Um, with two presenters, we have uh, Dr. David Nowak and Dr. Laura Jackson. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them real quick and then I'll hand the reins over to them. So David is a senior scientist and team leader with the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station out of Syracuse, New York. His research investigates urban forest structure, health, and change, and its effect on human health and environmental quality. He has authored over 350 publications and leads teams developing the iTree software suite that quantifies the benefits and values from vegetation globally. And he will be covering some of that research and findings in the iTree tool itself during his presentation. Following him, we'll have Dr. Laura Jackson, who is an interdisciplinary scientist with the US EPA's Office of Research and Develop Development out of the Research Triangle Park in um, North Carolina. She is a principal investigator in the Sustainable and Healthy Communities Research Program, leading the high resolution component of the Enviro Atlas Online National Mapping Tool. Her work addresses the linkages among urban ecosystem services, built infrastructure, and public health and well being. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and hand over the reins to um, Dr. Nowak. Just, just give me one second to get that over there. And then, um, David, you are then able to share your screen. All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes, everything is coming across. Okay, are you getting a little bit of an echo? Oh, no, it's better now. Okay. Uh, good morning. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. It's great to be here. As uh, Laura and I would like to say hello to you and thank you for your attendance. So, we're going to talk about urban forests and heat islands. So, what I'm going to do is start about urban forests in North Carolina because it's the basis of how urban forests affect heat islands. And I'll go into uh, some of the heat island impacts and some of the research we're doing. And then Laura will take over and talk more about urban forests and heat islands. So feel free to ask any questions. I'll be glad to take them throughout this. Um, just as a starting point, when I talk about urban forests, I talk about all trees within the city. So not just street trees or park trees. As you can see in this picture of Manhattan here, the trees exists throughout the city uh, in the parks and in, in, in the spaces between buildings and things like that. So when we're referring to urban forest, we're talking about the whole forest itself, not just one component. And this will be important in terms of relating trees to heat throughout the landscape because the heat's going to vary depending on where you're at. As we all know, there are various threats that are affecting urban forest. And I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in North Carolina from some of the data we have about North Carolina's urban forest, and then we'll get into heat islands, but you can see from this image, there's many things that are threatening urban forest, development, insects and diseases, climate change, fires. So the forests are going to be changing in the future, and the hope is if we understand how these forests are changing, we can mitigate some of that to create healthier forests in the future, but also do so that we can mitigate heat islands in the process. So one of the threats that are very significant, particularly in the Carolinas, is development. Uh, not just within the existing urban areas, but across the state. And I'll show you some of the data of projections of development within North Carolina. So in order to do that, we looked at historical patterns of development across the United States. And that's what this graph shows here. What you're seeing here is between 1990 and 2000, the x-axis is the percent of the urban land in the county. And the y-axis is the growth in percent in that county based on the, how much urban land there was on the x-axis. So what you can see from here is that as you have more and more urban land in a county, the growth rates increase every decade, up until you get to around 30 or 40 percent tree cover, and then it tends to stabilize to about 80 percent of the area is classified as urban, then it drops off. And that makes sense, because once you get over 80 percent urban, there's not much more land you can develop and classify to urban land. And when I talk about urban, what I'm talking about is census-defined urban lands of at least 500 people per square mile. So these are the areas where people tend to aggregate. So what it shows, which is a scary trend, is that as areas become more and more urbanized, as you move along the x-axis to the right side, growth rates tend to go up, which means we have a, we'll be into an accelerated growth phase because we tend to always move to the right. And as we move to the right, we move faster and faster to the right until we reach 
plateau of, of consuming pretty much all the rural lands and then it drops off because there's nothing else to consume. So this was the pattern in 1990 to 2000. So we then said, okay, let's look what happened to the pattern of 2000 to 2010 because we had that uh, economic depression in the late 2000s with the housing markets. And lo and behold, we found pretty much the same pattern in the next decade, a little bit less growth in the less urban counties, a little bit more growth in the more urban counties. So what we did to do our projections, and this will show you, I'll show you a map coming up to look at the, the country in North Carolina, is we took the average of the last 20 years of development patterns across the United States, and then said, let's project this forward to see what the country would look like over the next 50 years if these patterns of the last 20 years hold. So here's what the United States looked like in 2000. So the uh, white counties have less than 5% urban land. Blue counties have between five and 10%. As you move more to the red, you get higher and higher percent of the county classified as urban. So you see to the red counties, as you get around New York, Chicago, Atlanta, most of those county lands are classified as urban because they're heavily urbanized. So this is what census designated as urban land in 2000. This is not a projection. It was 3.1% of the United States land area was classified as urban land in 2000. And you can follow this graphic as we move up. In 2010, it went from 3.1 to 3.6. So again, this is what it is as of the last census, 2010. So if you want to either focus on the North Carolina area, which is already fairly colored in, um, but you also see the patterns across the nation. What I'm going to show you now is 10-year increments going forward of the projections up to uh, 2060. So here's 2010, we're at 3.6. 2020, we go to 4.3. 2030, we go to 5.2. 2040, we go to 6.2. 2050, we go to 7.3. And 2060, we go to 8.6. So you can see what happened to North Carolina in many areas. And what's interesting in this, which makes total sense, is where we are going to have land develop is where we already have urban land. We're not going in the middle of North Dakota and creating new cities because there's no infrastructure there. The areas like Raleigh, Durham, and some of these other cities that have high concentrations or high infrastructure of urban land will tend to expand outward because we have the road and pipe network and, and electrical utilities, so we just tend to expand outward. Um, I mean, they're basically, as population grows, we have two options. Either we densify, we, we make no more urban land, don't allow people to move out, and the cities that we have just become more dense, or, and that does happen in some cases, or we tend to expand outward, and that's what the projections are showing of the outward expansion. So you can see um, this is the pattern of percent growth in that 50-year period. You can see North Carolina uh, is projected in many areas to have greater than 25% of the county area reclassified from urban to rural over the next 50 years. You can see North Carolina, Florida, and the uh, Baltimore-Boston uh, corridor is going to have significant urban growth. But we're also starting to see, if you look around Atlanta, and a little bit around Chicago and New York, we're starting to get a donut hole effect because the center core of these cities are already fully developed and the expansion is going to occur outward. So we have urbanization occurring across the state. And this is important, particularly for North Carolina, because you are rated as number four in projections of urban growth. So nationwide, we're projecting 2 million acres uh, expansion per year of rural land being reclassified as urban, which means we're giving up forest and ag lands to put houses in and people. And we're going to grow from uh, 3.6 to 8.6. So that's um, a little bit under 100 million acres over that 50 year period. And that's greater than the size of Montana nationwide. It's going to convert from rural to urban land. And same time, urban population is going to grow to greater than 90%. In North Carolina, you're going to project it to move from your state is currently in 2010, 9.5% of your land area is classified as urban to go up to 23% by 2060. That's an increase of over 4 million acres of rural land that's going to be converted. And put that in perspective, Delaware, the state of Delaware is only 1.2 million acres. So you're in a position of significant growth, projected growth in the future. And that's going to affect urban forests that exist today. And also you have many more urban forests at the loss of rural forests. So where does North Carolina sit right now in terms of tree cover? The average US tree cover in the United States, it, it, tree cover within urban areas, is 39.4%. North Carolina sits at number five, actually, and your average tree cover within urban areas of North Carolina is 54.2%. So you have a lot of tree cover. 
you also have a lot of expansion going on. And this is the reason I tell you about this, because the structure of the forest, which is the amount of cover you have, its distribution is very important in terms of ecosystem services. This is going to relate to heat islands uh, coming up because heat islands are a contribution of both the, the forest itself and the, and the impervious surfaces that are occurring in, in urban areas across the nation. So why, why do you have tree cover within cities? So this is a question I'll ask for you to think about is what percent of trees and cities are actually planted? The answer is might be surprising to you. It's actually only about one in three trees are planted. And that's probably common for North Carolina also. It does vary across the nation as you move into drier regions, such as the deserts or Los Angeles. Uh, the percent of tree cover planted is actually higher. In Los Angeles, it's uh, nine out of 10 trees are planted because forests don't naturally regenerate there. But in areas like the Southeast and the Northeast where we have heavy, heavily forested regions, most of our forest is not coming from tree planting, it's coming from natural regeneration. And this uh, planting varies by land use. As we get more and more managed spaces, such as residential land, actually in residential lands, three out of four trees are planted. But as you move to less managed landscapes, such as open space, less than uh, one in 10 trees are being planted. So it's basically a combination of where you live, how much regeneration is going on, and how much you actually manage the landscape. The more you manage, the more you tend to plant, like in residential areas. Again, this will be important for shaping the forest in the future because you can use natural regeneration in certain areas. I mean, one of the ways to get more natural regeneration in North Carolina is stop mowing. If you stop mowing or stop putting impervious surfaces down, the forest will regenerate. The problem is we tend to mow and we tend to design landscapes. So the more we're managing it, uh, the more we tend to plant trees because we're, we're basically diminishing the capacity of natural regeneration to occur. One more thing about structure, and this relates to uh, North Carolina would be in the upper left there, the forested regions. On average, approximately in the US, tree cover in urban areas is around 40% in forested regions because most of our country is within, lives within forested regions, which is, if you think about it, why do we live in forested regions? What do people need and what do trees need? We both need water to survive. So we tend to move, put our cities in forested regions because there's ample water uh, for humans to survive and for trees to survive. So in forested regions, we have tree cover at around 40%. As you move to the Midwest or central part of the country where uh, more grassland areas exist, tree cover drops in urban areas to around 20%. And as you move to desert regions, uh, tree cover drops to around 10%. But what this graphic shows is of that 40%, 20% or 10% in those pie charts, how is that tree cover distributed? And what's interesting to see here uh, is where is the forest distributed is that about three quarters of all urban forests exist just within two land uses, that is residential and vacant lands. But you can see the proportion of that split changes as you move between forest, grass, and desert. In North Carolina, which is a forested region, we would estimate on average about 43% of your tree cover in the city comes from residential lands and about 37% comes from vacant and forested regions within the cities. That makes up about 75% approximately. As you move to grasslands, it shifts. The vacant land becomes less dominant and residential lands become more dominant with over half of the cover in the cities coming from residential. And as you move to deserts, almost three quarters of the tree cover uh, in desert regions comes from residential. What this is an, is an influence of natural regeneration is that as you move from forest to grassland to vacants, you have less and less regeneration. And so therefore planting becomes more important so the residential lands tend to dominate. So in some ways, North Carolina is blessed with a lot of tree cover, also blessed with having natural regeneration. So you're going to have a lot of your cover coming in from um, regeneration on these sites. Okay, so that's your cover. That's how your cover comes about and where you're going in the future. Where have you, where is, how has cover been changing within North Carolina? It's the next question. So we know we have trees there. Are, are we moving in the trend of having more tree cover or less tree cover? Well, unfortunately, North Carolina is like the rest, for most part, rest of the country is that tree cover is dropping. Pretty much uh, across almost all the states in the United States, uh, tree cover has dropped in the last, in this five year period from the early 2000s, 2010, sorry. Uh, tree cover and urban tree cover in North Carolina dropped by 0.6% between 2010 and 2015. Across the United States, you're less than the national average. Across the United States, tree cover dropped by 1% during that same period. And at the same time, impervious cover increased by 1%. So what we're having, this is almost universal, is tree cover going down and impervious cover going up. And this is going to be important for heat islands, as, as we'll show you coming up. 
Okay, so why did I talk about this structure, which is the, the, the number of trees or tree cover that you have and how it's going to change? The reason we need to understand structure, because structure is the baseline for pretty much everything we do in terms of management. The structure of the forest, again, how much cover you have, the species composition, where it's located, the tree sizes, basically the physical elements of the forest, determine the functions of the forest. If you have no trees, you will have no functions from those trees because they do not exist. If you have more trees and where they're located affect those functions, those functions being, uh, one of the functions being heat on it, mitigation. And those various functions that trees produce, produce some value to society. So what we try to do when we do urban forest management is we try to optimize the value to society, but we can't do that directly. We can't just say, I'm gonna have more value where we can't directly manipulate the functions. All we can manipulate is the structure. We can choose what trees to plant, where to plant them, when to plant them, what trees we're removing. And, and by doing so, either intentionally or unintentionally, intentionally being maybe I'm going to go out and directly plant a tree because I want to do so, unintentionally because uh, we did something that caused cover to go down or maybe even go up. We are constantly changing the structure through our actions. Um, so the hope is that we can develop management plans to optimize the structure to optimize the value. The structure is critical. These are my top 10 benefits derived from urban forestry. You can see, I've always said this, uh, cooler air temperatures, this heat on the impact is number one by far, uh, in my opinion. Some people argue that number two in my list, socioeconomic impacts is number one, but temperature drives so many other services across the landscape that changing temperatures influence air pollution, it influences energy use, it influences human comfort as we'll see coming up. So it ripples through uh, many facets, and it's going to be an issue coming up, especially with climate change. As cities get warmer, these, these impacts of trees are going to become more and more important. Uh, socioeconomic impacts, which I think are very important also, is that people see vegetation and their brainwave patterns change, their cortisol levels change. So we have our bodies react to seeing vegetation. I think this is very important also not to diminish that one, uh, but I, I still believe that temperatures are number one. You can see many of the other ones, air pollution removal, water quality, greenhouse gases. And from some of our national assessments that we've done, energy effects, air quality, and greenhouse gases, nationally, those three services alone, uh, which include avoid emissions, avoided emissions from energy effects, conservatively produce over $18 billion to society annually in our country. And that's conservative because we don't know socioeconomic valuation, water quality, UV radiation, and many of the other ones. But today we're gonna focus on uh, my number one list, which is air, cooler air temperatures. So what is a heat island? Heat island term was coined in 1818 uh, by Dr. Howard. It, it basically is the phenomenon that urban areas tend to be warmer than the surrounding rural areas, as you can see in this graphic of, of air temperature, late afternoon air temperatures um, in the downtown areas tend to be warmer than the, the rural areas. The question is, why is this? We know this has been happening for hundreds of years. Why, why is this occurring? Well, it has to do with the structure, which we just talked about, the structure of the city system. How much impervious cover do we have in the city and how much vegetative or water cover do we have within the cities? As we tend to urbanize, we tend to put down buildings and roads, which we need for transportation and housing, which are made of impervious surfaces. Impervious surfaces are uh, surfaces that are impervious to water, which is by design. We don't want our roofs to leak, so we make them impervious. Uh, these impervious surfaces are different materials. They tend to be thicker, tend to absorb heat, um, and they tend to be darker colors often. The roads tend to be tar, tends to be black. So darker surfaces absorb more heat. Uh, the surfaces themselves, because they're different materials, have different heat capacities, they tend to absorb that heat and also retain that heat. So which is why um, parking lots, I'll put it this way, to think about it when you're in a parking lot, the surface temperature of the car is probably warmer than the surface temperature of the tar itself because uh, if you ever touch a, a dark colored car on a hot sunny day, it, 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 that temperature gets really high on that surface, but that temperature of the car will cool down rather quickly where the tar will not. The tar in the buildings will hold that heat and tend to retain that heat and or, uh, radiate that heat back longer, which is why uh, the heat island effect, the difference between urban and rural areas, is greatest just after sunset. What happens after sunset, the surfaces such as trees and other surfaces uh, tend to cool down rather rapidly, while the buildings and the tower tend to cool down rather cold, 
slowly. So they re-radiate that heat back to the atmosphere. And the heat island occurs all throughout the day for the most part, but the greatest differential between urban and rural occurs just after sunset when the rural areas cool down rapidly. So why do the rural areas cool down rapidly? And another attribute of why are uh, heat islands existing in urban areas is not only just the impervious surfaces, it's the lack of water and tree surfaces within the city. So rural areas tend to be more natural, tend to have a lot more vegetation. Vegetation evaporates a lot of water. Evaporation is a cooling process. Uh, it basically takes a lot of energy to convert water from a liquid to a gas. You ever notice when you get outside of a pool, how quickly, and when you have water on your skin, you uh, tend to cool off rather quickly. Um, it's from the evaporation drawing heat from your skin. The same thing, these trees, they're evaporating water. They're moving water from the soils through their leaf surfaces out to the air, out to the air, uh, cools down uh, the atmosphere rather quickly. So these cities have more impervious surfaces, they heat up, they have less water that evaporates, they have less tree cover that evaporates the water. They also tend to block winds somewhat or they trap the heat themselves. So you have uh, at nighttime or even during the daytime, those tall buildings, the heat's trying to get back to the atmosphere. Those buildings tend to trap the heat back in. And in cities, we also produce our own heat. We burn a, burn a lot of fuel through cars and other engine processes, which pr produces anthropogenic heat. So we have all these factors going on that create cities to be warmer. But trees have an impact of uh, uh, reducing that. So you can see in this image, this is a surface temperature taken from a satellite. The bright red areas are the hottest and the dark green to blue areas are the coolest. Uh, you can get very significant surface temperature differences in heat islands, but the heat islands are actually considered to be an air temperature difference, which is much less than the uh, surface temperature differences. So heat islands tend to increase air temperatures by between one to six degrees centigrade. We tend to have warmer temperatures in the cities. The inverse of that is you can also have cool islands. So we create heat islands by removing trees and putting impervious surfaces on. Uh, this is an uh, illustration of Patterson Park in Baltimore and, and modeling of uh, air temperatures in the upper right. As we have parks, because there's a lot of water and evaporative processes going on through the grass itself, the soil and the trees, we tend to get cool, cool air being produced. And that cool air effect can actually, depending on wind speeds and, then, and how much cover you have in those parks, can actually cool air in the surrounding neighborhoods as the air passes over the park, cools down and then moves into the surrounding neighborhoods. You get these cool island effects. So urban in general cities, heat island overall, but within those heat islands, you can have cool islands as we have more and more vegetation. So it's a direct relationship between impervious surface and tree cover, and they tend to counterbalance each, or contradict each other in some ways. As we put impervious surfaces down, we tend to reduce tree cover, particularly in North Carolina, which is heavily forested. So surface temperatures, again, it's the surface temperature map. This, um, these can be produced from satellites. You can, this is an illustration of Syracuse, New York. You can see downtown areas tend to be the warmest, and water in the upper left, that's Lake Onondaga, that blue patch up there, that's a water body that tends to be cool. And in this uh, lower left, we have a forested stand. So the forest, these blue spots just tend to be forested areas that have high tree cover because they have evaporating a lot of water, as does a lake. And as you tend to move to more impervious areas, more concentrated, less trees, the temperatures tend to go up in surface. If you're interested in surface temperatures, there this is an illustration of, I zoomed into North Carolina, there is a heat island map. Sorry about that, the phone's ringing. Um, this is a heat island map. You can see on the web page down at the bottom, if somebody wants this, I can send you that link because it's gonna be nasty to write that one down. These are illustrations of surface temperatures derived from satellites uh, from across the nation for various cities to get an idea of where these surface temperatures are. So when it gets down to trees, again, it's the process. Leaves are very important in this process. They, they do two things in terms of mitigating the heat island, two major factors. One is they produce shade. So they're absorbing the radiation up in the leaves, which means the impervious surfaces beneath them, beneath them are not absorbing uh, the radiation and heating up. And at the same time, these leaves have stomates, these small holes, millions of them on the bottom of the leaves across the canopy. Those stomates open up during the daytime. They take water up through the tree and they evaporate them to at the leaf surface. And again, evaporation is a cooling process, which is a, a dominant factor. So it's shade and evaporation that dominates 
the role of, of this cooling effect within cities. And again, as we put more impervious surfaces down, we lose that evaporative potential, we lose that shading potential, and we're putting down surfaces that absorb heat. Species do make a difference in terms of selection of which trees do the best. In general, for almost all ecosystem services, large trees, because they have large leaf surface area, uh, long-lived trees do the best because they provide services over the longest period of time without having to be replaced. And in terms of heat island reduction, what you're trying to get at is species that are large, long-lived, but also have high transpiration rates. An example of some of these genera are Latinus, uh, the London plane tree, or uh, sycamores, eucalyptus out west, uh, oaks, some oaks, not all oaks. Again, with all these, not all of these genera, uh, basswood, the tilia, talpa, uh, horse chestnut, willows, uh, black gum, liquid amber, um, sweet gum, and then elms are some of the better ones from the modeling that we're doing that tend to have, because trees have different capacities to move water based on what are called xylem conduits. Some species have basically bigger pipes, if you will, within their uh, xylem to move water from the soil to the leaves. So there's studies that show that these different species with different xylem conduits tend to put more water. And the more leaves you have, and the more they have this capacity to move the water more quickly, the more they'll tend to evaporate the water. So there are differences among species, and we're working on that right now. Why do we worry about heat islands? Well, it's not just the heat itself, which is gonna be important, particularly with climate change in terms of human, human health and human comfort, but uh, air temperatures affect ozone formation. As you tend to get warmer days, we tend to have more emissions. We tend to have uh, stagnated air, which allows the fo formation of ozone to occur. Uh, we uh, and higher temperatures tend to be a greater catalyst to create ozone because it's a chemical process in the atmosphere. Uh, we tend to have greater energy use when it gets to be warmer. It alters water cycles because again, it's a, the pumping of water is increased as water as air temperatures go up. And again, it affects human comfort and human health. So again, this is the number, to me, number one in terms of the impacts that trees have because it, it affects so many other aspects of, of our lives and the quality of living. Okay, uh, some of the studies we're working on to show you where we're going. Uh, this is a study done by Gordon Heisler, he used to work for us, he retired a few years ago, looking at the city of Baltimore. And this is a modeling of air temperatures in Baltimore. And as you can see on the left-hand side is differences in daytime temperatures. And the right-hand side for this illustration is difference in, in nighttime temperatures. So you can see at nighttime, the downtown Baltimore area is much warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And it's less so during the daytime. The differences in the daytime between urban and rural is only about five degrees centigrade. The differences uh, at nighttime is up to 13 degrees centigrade. And this has to do with these uh, that affect the temperature. It's basically upwind and local tree cover and impervious cover. So it's the closer you are to the site, the tree cover on your site and the impervious cover on your site is very important, but also the upwind tree cover and the upwind uh, impervious covers is important in determining the temperatures at your site because wind moves across those surfaces. And if it's moving across, let's say a cool island, you're, you're bringing in cool air to your site. If it's moving across a parking lot, you're bringing hot air to your site. So it's not only the tree cover at your site, the tree cover upwind. Other factors that affected temperature in this region was uh, what we call antecedent moisture condition. Did it rain in the previous days? Prior to that, that has a big influence in, in, in affecting evaporation and cooling of air temperatures. And also cold air drainage. Baltimore has many hills, so air, cold air tends to drain downhill. So uh, elevation does have an impact as, with the movement of temperature. So you can see some of that we found, uh, this is again, modeled air temperatures, not surface temperatures. Uh, we are building and have built a new model that we're putting into iTree right now. And I'll talk about iTree at the end. Uh, this is an air temperature model. It's a physical-based air temperature model. It's not a regression-based. So it basically looks at the surfaces and the model and the actual, I'm sorry, actual measure temperatures and try to simulate out what would the temperatures be on an hourly basis across the city. And what we've taken this model, it's been published, you can see down there by Yang and others. Um, we have now are moving this to connecting this with uh, impacts of temperature on human health. And this is a paper we just submitted a few weeks ago looking at what happens if we took the city of Baltimore and increased tree cover by 10%, or in some cases, we looked at cases of what happens if no tree cover existed. 
and trying to relate that to human health. And what we found is increasing tree cover in Baltimore by 10 percent, reduced annual mortality by 84 to 251 uh, deaths per year, a reduction in that, depending on which uh, metric or model you used in terms of relating temperature to, to mortality. And that equates to a, a value of $690 million per year to $2.1 billion based on savings of human lives due to reduced temperatures. And what's important to note on this graphic here in the map, it's, as you can see, if you remember the, the temperature map that I showed you in Baltimore, it's not necessarily where the temperatures become the coolest that influence human health. It's also who lives in those areas. The most susceptible populations tend to be the elderly. So if you if you can cool temperatures, you want to target your cooling, not necessarily to just where the warmest areas exist, but where the warmest areas exist with the most susceptible populations uh, to heat stress. So we can see some pockets of high mortality changes in the more suburban areas, if you will, around Baltimore or towards the edge of the city. It's not necessarily in the downtown core. So heat island effects is not just about reducing temperatures, but it's about protecting human lives. And you have to look at the, the heat island effects in context with the population that exists. So lastly, I'll end on this. Um, we are building that model right now to do, do runs across the nation to look at tree, tree effects, urban tree effects on air temperatures and human health nationwide. It'll be another year or so at least before we do it because there's a lot of calculations that have to go into this. Uh, so, but iTree does do other services and will help you calculate the structure of your forest. And I'm just going to do a, a promo here. It's a free series of free tools here that are available that we encourage people to use as free technical support. There's a whole suite of tools from phone apps uh, to maps. We have various maps on at which we actually have uh, surface temperature maps in iTree landscape for the whole United States. I just encourage you, if you're interested in urban forests and many of the ecosystem services that I showed in the slide earlier, uh, carbon sequestration, air pollution, temperatures, uh, to explore iTree. Um, again, there's tools from phone apps to sketching on Google Maps to collecting field data to using photo interpretation on Canopy and iTree Landscape, which is a series of maps that are out there. So that's the end of my commercial for iTree, but we encourage people to use that. Um, so in summary, before I pass on to Laura, is going to talk more about her work, her work on heat islands and her work with Environmental Atlas and other things. Uh, North Carolina's urban forests are changing and they are going to change and you can't stop it. Change is inevitable. Forests are always going to change. And the question is, can we direct it in the right fashion? If we understand how it's changing and why it's changing, we might be able to uh, make it move to a better process. And these trees and forests will reduce heat islands. The more we can pack trees, particularly in strategically planting them, and, and it's not only about having the trees, making sure it has ample water to evaporate. So if you put a tree in and it doesn't have water, it's not going to produce, it'll still produce shade, but it won't produce the evaporative cooling. And the key to this, all of this is understanding, communicating these values. If you want to improve, we have to understand the system better and make better decisions. So with that, I will end. And I thank you for your time. And I'm not sure if we have, I'm sure there is time for questions, but if we want to take a few questions now or have Laura start next. Okay, I don't see any questions in the question panel. Um, I will go ahead and switch over to um, Laura and make her a presenter. But if uh, the attendees, if any of you guys have questions for um, Dr. Nowak or upcoming um, Dr. Jackson, we can make sure that they get uh, addressed at that point. So um, I don't see any coming in, Dave, so I think you're good there, but we'll make sure that if something comes up, um, uh, we'll go from there but um actually we did have one question come in um so laura i handed over presenter rights to you but i'll go ahead and, and let dave address this question um it's come from richard wilson in talking about manipulating the structure of the urban forest you only mentioned planting please discuss how important the preservation of forest fragments would be compared to cutting everything then replanting, which seems wasteful oh yeah that's uh, richard a good point um I didn't have time to get into that, but uh, to me, preservation is more important than planting. Those trees that exist out there, that 50 some percent tree cover you have, it's probably more important to preserve that, but eventually that cover will go away. So we need to think about how do we regenerate the forest, but protecting the existing forest is huge. And actually St. Lawrence with the EPA, we had a meeting in the EPA, this was maybe 10, 12, 20 years ago. And 
they only gave in, in terms of the process of the clean air process we were trying to argue with them and saying you, you, they only gave credit for planting trees and i said this makes no sense we should give credit to preserving the canopy out there and we were doing a project in new york city so i said to them i said basically here's what we're going to do then and tell me how you're going to handle this i'm going to clear cut central park and replant it with trees you will give me credit for planting trees but the city will lose overall because we're not giving credit to the conservation of the canopy so I say that because it's important to give credit to the existing forest and protect it because most of the services, well, almost all of the services right now are coming from that. And we want to sustain those big trees because the benefits of big trees easily are 60 to 70 times more in terms of uh, production of services with big trees versus small trees. And it takes a long time for a small tree to get there. But uh, that was an excellent point, Richard. Okay, great. Um, so. Yes, um, please continue a asking any questions. We'll make sure they get addressed. Um, but for now, um, Laura, you are good to go if you want to start your presentation. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. That was very interesting, Dave. I, I um, hope I can fill in some um, from the information uh, from the Forest Service, or we think of as our official source on, on trees in the US. Um, I'm going to minimize this. Um, sidebar with all the chat and information um so if there's something that's happening there that i need to know about um leslie please give a shout out um i think it will work to go into slideshow mode but please let me know if um if something uh changes uh when i do that there we go all right you are good Laura. we that are works. also okay great at, uh, I work in uh, the US EPA Office of Research and Development, uh, and my office is based in Research Triangle Park. We have had a, uh, a strong focus on ecosystem goods and services for about 10 years now, um, really trying to make uh, bring awareness of um, the, uh, the importance of, of nature to um, our society, our livelihoods, our very health and well-being and quality of life. Many of these things can be monetized, uh, but many of them are, uh, are not able to be monetized. People may think of them as, as priceless. And so oftentimes when something is not quantified, it is lost um, perhaps by accident, uh, perhaps is disregarded. Uh, so we're trying to develop tools and conduct research uh, to um, help people make decisions where uh, important ecosystem services are not lost unintentionally to, to incorporate nature and in particularly in urban areas um, in a more um, mindful way so that it can be part of our strategy and planning and growth. Um, so one of the things that, um, that we are doing uh, is uh, collecting research on uh, various uh, topics, uh, various specific ecosystem services like uh, heat and health, which we're focusing on today. And I'll, I'll show you a, 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 another free tool that's uh, kind of fun to use and easy to use. Right here, I've extracted some information from that online tool just to show um, some selected research from climates um, in the first two cases that are somewhat similar to uh, the temperate climate in North Carolina. Of course, we have three distinct climate zones here, but in general, um, we can take these findings into consideration for our location. Um, so for thermal comfort, air temperature and how it feels to us, that's very different as Dave was saying than surface temperature where you can, you can burn yourself on a car roof or maybe fry an egg on a hot street. Um, of course, we don't feel those surface temperatures on our on our skin unless we're lying on them. So the, the um, uh, one, uh, one expression of surface temperature is known as globe temperature, which also takes humidity into account. And um, a study has found that, um, that uh, shady, shaded areas can reduce temperatures as, as much as uh, 12 and a half degrees Fahrenheit uh, compared to unshaded areas on a hot day, which is really enough to make a, a big difference in Uh, in, in your health and in your mobility and things that you're able to do outside. Um, another way of looking at it is when do people typically turn on their air conditioning? And while these numbers seem kind of low to me, uh, the uh, 
the existence of shade trees around buildings has been observed to increase the temperature by almost three degrees Fahrenheit, um, um, at which people feel they need to turn on their air conditioning. And so that um, also saves energy. And uh, then with that feedback loop, re reducing fewer greenhouse gases um, also helps the external climate as well. And a, a study from multiple locations um, actually did find that um, there are cases where trees and other vegetation uh, can increase discomfort in hot and humid areas, in particularly because of the, uh, the blocking of the wind and the increased humidity, which can make, uh, make you feel more uncomfortable on hot days. So there are a lot of factors here, a lot of moving parts, and there's, there's a lot to consider, which is one reason the iTree tool is so helpful because um, if you're using it at the um, at like a parcel level or a neighborhood level, you can really get into specific tree species that um, are going to behave uh, in your climate in ways that you're going to want to consider. You know, all trees are not created equal, so it's it's very helpful for pointing out what trees are going to do best for the services that you're looking for. So we did talk about surface temperatures, which are, are generally much higher on hot days. And uh, again, selected studies uh, that I wanted to share with you um, show that the tree shade uh, reduces the, the surface temperatures. And in this case, you know, by a whole lot more, um, you know, 30 plus degrees. Uh, actually, well, this study here found that lawn and grass cover reduced them even more. Uh, but didn't have any effect on the, the perceived sense of heat, which is, is so important for human health. Um, there are, you can have green roofs and green walls. Uh, planting uh, in a study that, plant, that uh, built some brick walls uh, in, a, in an experimental site and planted them uh, with shrubs in this case, um, cooled, uh, cooled the wall surfaces uh, by a great deal more than not having the trees there at all. Roadside trees can reduce the uh, heat on buildings too. So it uh, doesn't all have to be on the parcel itself um, as long as uh, it's nearby. I think you know this is a, a, um, an urban forestry venue platform here today. And so I'm, I'm making an assumption that um, perhaps much of the audience um, are, are working on um, forestry on, on city lands. Uh, I don't know that for sure. But the roadside area is often where um, the city has a right of way. And so, you know, it's useful to know what you can do on public lands um, if your jurisdiction doesn't extend into private parcels. Dave also mentioned the cool island effect and uh, explained that um, that, that has like a, a, it has an extension effect. It's cool in a park and a forest in a city, but the areas around it will also be cooler. Um, and that can be in uh, one study, or I guess this was a review, this first bullet, um, of up to six degrees or more Fahrenheit. Um, size of the cool island may not make the difference. Um, in fact, again, we have that situation where the, the, if it's, it's um, really thick tree cover, it can retain heat um, if the uh, air movement is restricted because of the density of the trees. So, um, that was from a review, and uh, I'll show you the sources of all this information. But cool islands, uh, perhaps the size is is not necessarily a factor. But uh, various studies have shown that the shape is very important. So long, skinny, or very convoluted shapes are cooling more adjacent land than, say, circular or square shapes. You may be familiar with that principle from conservation biology. Um, where um, edge to area ratio is very important. And for often for disturbance sensitive species, you want more interior, you want more area to edge ratio. But in this case for cooling, you actually may want more, you want more edge and less core because, um, because it's longer, there's uh, more of more neighboring area that can be cooled. So that's kind of a, you know, a, a complicating factor of using nature to increase societal benefits is that sometimes, you know, one form of nature, one design is going to prov provide certain benefits, say, you know, for biodiversity of sensitive species. But another service that you may want, say cooling, uh, may require a different kind of pattern, different kind of structure in your designed 
um, ecological area. So there's um, there's some factors to be considered and weighed, and you know needs to be a uh, kind of a conscious decision of uh, knowing that if you go in one way for one societal benefit, it may actually um, not benefit another uh, another service that, that you're looking to enhance. Um, I in several studies that have talked about the cooling distance from a, a park edge, uh, the, the largest distance that I saw was about 500 meters, uh, which is pretty far from a park edge into the neighboring uh, residential area, for example, where they can benefit from that cooling distance. And that will depend, as Dave said, on wind um, and elevation and, and other factors. So I'm getting this information from a tool that I have led uh, the development of for about 10 years uh, called the EcoHealth Relationship Browser. And it is basically a, um, a really fun to use interactive front end to a giant literature review. We update it um, every two or three years. And the focus is on ecosystem services um, in uh, not just urban, but in other kinds of ecosystems as well. But it opens up on this screen and um, you can see that heat mitigation is one of the services that is described. And uh, I'm gonna go to this um, and we can look interactively at the tool um, and hopefully that will load. Is everybody seeing, uh, well, tell me, Leslie, if you're not seeing this, uh, switch to the internet. Uh, this is the entry uh, portal to the browser and uh, give some uh, information about it and what it what it does and doesn't do and a uh, paper that we wrote to um, substantiate our methods and so forth. Um, but the main event is the browser itself and it opens on the screen that, uh, make it a little smaller, that I was just uh, showing on the slide. So if we were to look at um, our interest here today primarily is urban, ecosystems and heat island medication. And so these little blue buttons here will pop up um, information about that um, in the beginning summarizes um, what is itemized below um, topic by topic. Um, so there are dozens in some cases of papers included in, uh, in these reviews. Um, there's a section on urban cool islands, and uh, there's a section on um, hot and dry climates where uh, there are more issues to consider where trees may not be a natural vegetation type and water is limited. Um, so there are uh, alternatives that can be used, uh, but for vegetated areas like ours, naturally vegetated, um, there's a lot of information that you can find here that perhaps uh, you can apply in your work. And if you find something here that is uh, so particular interest to you um, and you want to know more, you can click on any of these sources and it will take you straight to our bibliography where we have the abstract for that paper. And uh, then you can um, go uh, and read more about a particular paper if that's uh, if you want to go deep into um, the scientific literature. But it's um, presented here in a way for the general public um, to get a, a sense of uh, what has been found about um, you know, the, the ability of urban systems to reduce uh, the heat island effect. And anything that's uh, in, this, in the center here, in this case, urban ecosystems, there will be a sidebar just explaining about what that means. Uh, if you click on something else like uh, heat island mitigation uh, or heat hazard mitigation, that will move to the center. And uh, if it's an ecosystem service, uh, such as heat hazard mitigation, we will still see we will see all the uh, the ecosystems that we we discuss in this browser tool, and in this case it's uh, drylands also and urban ecosystems, and then a variety of health outcomes that have been linked to heat or heat mitigation in the literature, and all of them also have um, you know an explanation of uh, what has been found concerning in this case uh, heat and uh, COPD. You know, hospital admissions, many other, even vision. Let's see what it says about vision. Um, so this heat can trigger some um, uh, events during pregnancy uh, when the eyes are developing in the fetus uh, that can be affected by extreme heat. So um, this is a new section for us that we added in our current update that we're doing. Um, vision is a new health outcome for this tool. So that's kind of exciting. 
So I just want to show you um, the other uh, ecosystem services that are covered in this tool in addition to heat. Uh, the last thing you looked at will now be at the top. And so the, there's, uh, that's a buffering service of trees. It's, it's, it's uh, buffering a bad, let's say. And the same with water hazard mitigation, that would be flooding. Um, there's very little on drought, surprisingly, but we want to include what we can on drought under here because vegetation is so important for retaining water on site. And there's just not as much written on that as on flooding. Another buffering service is, is water quality when you have poor Contaminants in the water, trees and vegetation, of course, um, are really great at filtering it. Uh, but then we have a number of, uh, oh, and air quality, of course. How could I forget another big part of eye tree and um, service of, of a variety of different tree species to filter pollutants and divert them. Um, but there are a couple of health promotional services that we really like to highlight as well. And that's the ability, the opportunity that ecosystems provide for healthful behaviors and healthful lifestyles. And certainly uh, a well-known one is, is physical activity, that parks and street trees and, and other types of um, greenery um, can get people out and, uh, and walking and not just walking um, or biking, playing games, but just interacting, uh, which also has benefits for health. And uh, the aesthetics that Dave mentioned, engage with nature is, um, a really intriguing benefit of ecosystem services, of uh, urban ecosystems and other ecosystems that has is really exploded in the research field. And um, while a lot of the studies are not causal experiments, there is a body of research that's growing in evidence and providing a stronger and stronger weight of evidence. That there's really something there to just being in nature and listening to birdsong and hearing water babbling in a brook and um, just seeing, you know, trees swaying in the breeze and all that sort of thing. I think we know from our intuitive experiences that is relaxing, is stress relieving. Um, it's a real restful break for the mind. Um, there is, this may be one of our biggest sections on the health side of, of so many different health outcomes that are linked in more and more papers uh, to um, either there may, may be no other explanation for why people spending time in a park or having more vegetation and tree cover around their homes score better on certain health metrics. And so it's, it's presumed that it might be because of engagement with nature. And the more studies we have like that, uh, it does build a weight of evidence. But we also, there are also a great number of controlled experiments in the field of environmental psychology that um, deal with cognitive rest and restoration, relief from ADHD symptoms, um, mood elevation, things like that that, um, that seem to, to be linked in controlled experiments with, um, with engagement with nature. And then there's this whole field of forest bathing that you may have heard of Shinrin-yoku in Japan and now spreading. It's also a lot of research in Korea and other Asian nations and um, that uh, there are real um, psychological benefits and also biophysical benefits that may uh, involve uh, an increase in uh, cancer killing cells, really fascinating area of research. But we're here to talk about heat today primarily. So I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, let's see, where do we leave off? Okay, so we were talking about, uh, hmm, no. Yes, uh, placement. So uh, in your professions, you probably have, um, you know, these your quandaries of trade-offs, you know, do we distribute trees evenly or across a city? What about putting them where the, there's the busiest areas, downtown areas where there's a lot of pedestrians and bus stops and places where trees could be providing shade to more people? And those would be, um, if we were talking about jurisdictional issues, you know, if it's an urban forestry program, possibly those would be limited to road signs. There are some choices there. Um, also choices among different kinds of public parcels. Do we increase the tree cover in parks? What about putting more trees around places like hospitals and, and daycare centers and uh, um, assisted living facilities, uh, even jails? You know, there's research on window views of trees and, and prisoner behavior. 
where there are the more people in need may be a good strategy for tree planting. Uh, these are things to consider given your stakeholders and, um, and your local priorities. So there are a lot of tools online to help with um, mapping these things. I'm, I'm a spatial uh, scientist, so I always want to see maps. And uh, a lot of these maps, even if they don't come from EPA, are available in our EnviroAtlas tool, and I'll provide the website for that in a minute. But you can certainly map um, uh, where vulnerable populations are and where structures uh, would indicate more um, benefit from planting tree cover, like where you have highest intersection density. Research has shown that that's where you have the highest walkability is where you have the most street intersections, because that's often where there are the most businesses, um, where more, more destinations. So that's a, that's a uh, something that can be, is mapped across the whole country. And um, EPA Smart Location Database from census data, um, you probably have really great local data on where there are sidewalks and bike lanes and transit stops. So a combination of local and nationally available data can really help with considering the density issues of, of prioritizing where to plant trees. And then the vulnerable populations, as I said, the great array of census data that's available out there. Um, we have actually served that in a way that's much easier to look at than directly on the census site. Um, and our tool for um, national mapping uh, is down here, www.epa.gov slash enviroatlas. And uh, we have a really good interface that is actually available to for a lot of tools in EPA, not just us. But you can look at where, not just where the, Dave mentioned elderly, but what about low income populations who may not all have air conditioning, especially in cooler areas, maybe in the mountainous areas of the state where people aren't expecting it to get really hot. But in recent times, we are seeing much more extreme heat events. The linguistically isolated who may not get notices or may not you know, be able to hear radio announcements or read flyers that public health officials may be circulating about an upcoming heat wave. So these are gonna be more vulnerable populations who may suffer um, in an extreme heat event. So um, I recommend you know, mapping these things uh, for your area and trying to understand, um, probably you already do this to some extent, uh, where, um, where your tree cover could be best located to benefit the population. Urban forestry maps are a godsend to our work. Uh, they're not um, available everywhere, fine scale tree mapping. Uh, the Forest Service has made available for the nation um, a very good map at 30 meter resolution for every 30 meter pixel, they show the percent of tree cover in that pixel. And that is available across the US. Um, and so if you don't have local tree cover mapping, it is a way to get a sense of where areas in your community are lacking tree cover and a way to zone in on that. Um, some people do have a very fine resolution land cover mapping, and we do this in selected cities where we've been able to fund this activity. And we have this for in North Carolina for the Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough, Hillsborough area. Um, and so you can really get a sense of um, exactly where the tree cover is along roads and around housing. Um, you can really do a lot with creating additional maps from the um, one meter land cover data, which we have done um, in about, uh, well, 30 metropolitan areas, but it's about 1,400, 1,450 cities and towns across the U.S. So Dave had shown um, the heat map from uh, satellites, and we have found that mapping uh, greenery at one meter using a moving window of 250 meters, how much green space is around every point in the city within a quarter square kilometer is, is a very good proxy for um, for the satellite maps of heat. So um, you can really pick out hot spots where you might wanna zero in on planting trees or other vegetation or removing impervious surface, replacing it with semi-pervious surface. Um, you know in your communities where the tree, where the schools and daycare centers and other, and other important facilities are. A lot of those don't have, um, in many communities, uh, tree cover or green space. Um, within view or within some range of the building, uh, say 50 or 100 meters. And so we map those and then we can see what block groups in this case 
we would want to concentrate on, in this case, the darker blue ones, are where there's um, the most number of schools with um, very little green space in the view shed, which we mapped because of the cognitive benefits for learning to have uh, greenery outside a window, but it also applies to uh, cooling the schoolyard and the school building. And down on the lower left is a map. Uh, so we incorporate a variety of iTree metrics in our EnviroAtlas maps. And this uh, on the lower left is a map of the, um, the uh, reduction in nighttime ambient temperature uh, provided by tree cover by census block. And then we overlay uh, vulnerable populations, in this case, um, the highest percentage of low-income population. So the strategy would be to look for the block groups that have the in the light yellow, they have the, um, the lowest benefit from tree cover for heat reduction, and where you have the bigger orange circles, where you have a higher percentage of um, low-income population. So again, that's a way to zero in on areas where you might want to prioritize, where you have the vulnerable people and you have the lowest tree cover. And uh, we have we have dozens of different maps of. Uh, of these proxies for ecosystem services and on the lower right is just an example of uh, tree cover or vegetated cover in this case along um, 50 meter stream and lake buffers. So again, it pops out where uh, in these areas in red and orange where you may have most concerns. So if you thinking about planting trees and, uh, and one priority is to also improve um, stream quality, then this map helps you figure out where um, streams are in need of some vegetative buffering to keep uh, pollutants out and, and to cool the streams themselves, because uh, there's a lot of degradation that occurs from thermal stress on aquatic systems. Now, again, just some nation data we have for the whole nation. Um, there's uh, quite uh, hundreds of data layers um, in this EnviroAtlas tool. One that um, you may be interested in is a downscaled population map where uh, using land cover and slope and, and other um, variables, we estimate where population is most likely to be within a block group. So um, you have a finer sense of uh, where you have concentrations of people, particularly in areas that aren't super urban where the block groups are really big, um, but the people aren't distributed evenly throughout the block group. So this helps users identify where there are pockets of people um, that uh, if you're using census block group data, you're not gonna be able to tell where the people are concentrated. And then we also have a, um, a floodplain map that is, uh, that is brand new and there's a publication behind it. Well, what's really great about this is FEMA hasn't gotten around to mapping everywhere um, in the country with updated 100 year floodplain maps. Um, so there are some, some important areas that um, don't have their um, don't have floodplain maps in this time of, of more hurricanes and more flooding. So while this map can't be used for insurance purposes, it's not an official FEMA map. It may be helpful to fill in some floodplain areas um, that are in your community that you don't have um, up to date information on. So. Um, I think we're running out of time, but I encourage you to check out um, all of these free government tools that are were developed with um, with the public use in mind, and they do all have free technical support, and uh, they they do have a lot of positive feedback, and we hope that they will be useful to you in your work, and we are available to you to um, any time to answer questions and get. Um, get use examples or whatever you may need to, uh, to assist with, um, you know, these tools helping you make better decisions, which is which is why we develop them and, and why we, we go out and talk to people about them. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I hope we can have a little bit of discussion before this, uh, this session is over this morning. Yes, of course, thank you, Laura. Um, lots of really useful information in there. Um, so now we have time for questions, um, and you can post your questions in the question panel box there, and Mindy will make sure um, that they get answered. So I know we already have a couple of questions in there. I'm going to go ahead and let Mindy um, work on getting those uh, answered. Okay, okay. great.
Um, we do have a question from Alan Moore. Um, he would like to know, um, either Laura or Dave could answer this. Do the models for transpiration take into account reductions in transpiration that may occur due to diseases that reduce leaf function? I guess uh, I wants to address the leaf function aspect. I can I can talk. I, this, uh, Dave, I can talk from the eye tree side. Um, the, the model will take into account leaf area. So if the insects defoliate the tree, that'll be accounted for. If the insects are changing some sort of process in the existing leaves, um, then it would not be. So maybe a bark beetle or something, a, a borer that might bore into the tree might affect. But if it doesn't show, from the eye tree's perspective, it doesn't show up in the leaves dropping or changing shape or anything like that, um, we will not pick it up. We'll assume that the leaves that are out there based on surface area are functional leaves and not dysfunctional leaves. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Richard Wilson and, and uh, Laura. I'm guessing this might be a follow-up to what you just presented. Um, he'd like to know who cares about human health and well-being. That is, what level of government has the inclination or the power to use the urban forest to enhance human health? Um, he also would like to know what do the best cities do? What do the best cities do, and which cities are the best? Well, those are some big questions. Um, EPA does not have jurisdiction over land use decisions um, unless we're talking about Superfund site um, or something that's covered by um, federal regulations. Uh, why we are doing this is because um, we think that, you know, we assume that everybody cares about their personal health and their family's health. Um, and that uh, providing information to help people make better decisions is, is within our purview. So we don't tell people what to do, uh, but we we are providing scientifically vetted information that will hopefully support more informed decisions. Um, let's see, what cities do this best? Who? Uh, I mean, I know of certain examples here and there. I don't know about who does it best. I see, you know, you see pictures on the web of of uh, vertical. gardens in some very dense Asian cities that um, are designed to clean air and provide aesthetics. And, you know, these are very innovative ideas of how to use space, uh, how to plant vegetation in limited space and, and use in vertical space. Um, there are, uh, yeah, I just know, you know, certain cities of what I've heard about and hearsay, I mean, we haven't done a ranking, so I'm, I'm uncomfortable like saying uh, any particular place. So uh, that's a conversation I would love to uh, give some more time to if I'd be happy to chat offline about the uh, full extent of your questions there. I'm, I'm not sure this is the, we're gonna have enough time to do that here today. Okay, great. Well, thank you for, for touching on that at least. Um, I have another question from um, Robert Murden and I'm not, I uh, think maybe Laura was the one that mentioned air conditioners. So I'm going to ask you, Laura, um, how were you able to isolate the fact that shade trees are present? Was the cause of people turning on or not turning on their air conditioners? It might not have been well, Laura, it might have been Dave. <laughs> no, I, it was me. I'd have to go to the paper and read about their methods, uh, which is all publicly available. And, uh, and you could do the same. Um, yeah, I, I don't have that, the methods of design of that study um, top of mind, um, but it is something that is in the peer reviewed scientific literature. So I'm, you know, we take that as being, um, you know, very well vetted, but I'd have to look at the paper. All right. I am not seeing any more questions at this time. Um, wait a minute. Oh, we have one. <laughs> Um, Nancy Stairs. Um, okay. 
uh, health in relation to trees and nature is increasingly being researched and there are increasing funding opportunities that address human health related to nature and recreation. So there is interest coming from health professionals, hospitals, or community development. These are some new partners for urban forestry professionals and for messaging to communities. So I'm thinking um, that's Nancy's comment that, um, to, to make to everyone. Um, I don't think that's a question specifically that needs to be answered. I just didn't know if either very, very one of you true. wanted to add to that. Well, it's, it's very true. Dave may have some things he wants to add, but it is, it is making for some new partnerships. And it's uh, these are, if you work across disciplines in your cities, which you may well do, it's um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a learning curve to trying to speak one another's language. I, I think it's really exciting that physicians are starting to write nature prescriptions, which indicates that um, this information is, is getting through to, um, a profession that may, you know, for uh, many years has been more focused on um, perhaps uh, treatment of of illness uh, rather than the prevention. Um, and it's it's a it's great progress towards kind of the more integration of what's going on in one's uh, in one's entire environment. Um, that uh, that the people are saying, you know. If you're feeling stressed or depressed, or you know, it may it may help to get out and walk in the park uh, rather than just um, you know starting with a prescription and um, not changing anything else about your about your lifestyle. I don't know if Dave has any insights to add to that. Yeah, I, thanks, Laura. I think that's that's an important topic. I think this is the wave of urban forestry right now in terms of research is trying to figure this out. I, I think we need to be careful as to, to know the cause and effect and make sure it's not associative or correlative. Uh, the big question is why and how are the trees doing this to us, which will help us understand how we should design forests better, what species might be better, what designs. But I think that is a, and all those new partners is a, is a whole new area in the last 10 years or so uh, that will be very important in the coming years. Uh, one other comment, I think, from Robert's comment on that paper about uh, trees and uh, elect, or, uh, air conditioning use, sorry. Uh, I, I haven't read the paper. My guess would be if they're talking air temperatures, that having trees around building will reduce the surface temperature of the buildings. Therefore, it may be warmer outside, but your building will stay cooler. Therefore, you will not turn your air conditioning on until it's warmer outside. Um, I'm assuming they're talking air temperature differences outside, not internal to the building, but it could just be that having trees around the buildings keep the building cooler. Therefore, as it heats up outside, you would be, there'd be a lag time before you would turn the air conditioning on or your thermostat because the interior is built uh, cooler from the, the shade. But that's a guess. Great, thank you. Um, I have one more question from Robert. I believe it's, um, he's asking you again, Dave. Uh, what, why do you believe that the reduction of human mortality is caused by reductions in temperatures? Um, well, there's a whole host of studies, and Laura hinted some of those in the literature, that temperature affects health and well-being. It's often nighttime temperatures that affect thermal stress and our, our bodies react. It's not just mortality, but it's also certain diseases are tied to temperatures. So I think our bodies, uh, I, I'm not a, a doctor in terms of uh, medical doctor, so uh, there are relationships to temperature and, and human health, definitely mortality in terms of it triggers probably uh, other events that would lead to, to death. Um, it's not like the heat's going to kill you directly. Something's going to happen in your body, whether it be a heart attack. I'm not sure what it is. I have to read the literature more on this. Um, but there are associations with, well, look at the heat wave. I mean, there's, there's two types of thermal stress. One is the heat wave events where the elderly populations are more susceptible. So these, these high heat wave events that killed thousands of people in Europe and in uh, Chicago in the last 20 or 30 years, I remember the, the dates of those heat waves. Um, so there's the extreme daytime heating events where the bodies can't cool down, uh, but there's also, it's nighttime, the body can't, if the bodies don't cool down at nighttime also leads to triggering of certain events in the body that, that lead to trigger mortality, particularly in elderly that are, are more vulnerable populations that are already susceptible to um, certain events, medical events. If you wanna know, I can look it up for you. I have to go back through the literature and see what the actual triggering events are or send you some papers on that. Yeah, those, um, those studies are uh, do have more of a causal basis um, because 
you know, they're population based and they know what their general death rate is um, on just uh, normally. And then if you have a heat wave and you see a surge of deaths the same day, one day after, two days after, three days after, and then it drops off again back to average, you know, if you, uh, that is a, um, that is a before and after type of analysis. And um, it is, uh, it does provide strong evidence of the, um, of the triggering event. I mean, it's possible that there was something else that was happening at exactly the same time. But when you see that over and over again, and it's, it's not a snapshot in time, it's a, it's a, they have before data, during data, after data, it's, um, it is, uh, it does provide pretty strong evidence of causality. Right, but the question I guess w would have been uh, is what what in the body? My guess is it's probably either cardio or respiratory in some fashion, because uh, most of the mortality is related to cardio or, or pulmonary events that are that the heat is triggering something going on. That's why I, I don't know what the exact triggers are. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all of the questions we have. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of data and research out there on this that you can, as Laura kind of showed with Enviro Atlas, you can really get in there and, and get the whys and hows behind this research through that program. Um, and so hopefully everybody's left with um, some resources that they have at their fingertips between those two programs that were highlighted today. Um, that they could bring into their management strategies and future planning for urban green spaces um, to help make better informed decisions and guide policy and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of information out there. We are out of time. So if you do have any questions that come up or want to um, have further conversations with, with either one of the presenters, um, you can get in touch with me and I can forward you along to them or you can easily find their information on their websites that they talked about uh, as well and you can reach out to them at your own uh, convenience. But lots of information. I really do appreciate your time and effort um, today, um, Dr. Nowak and Dr. Jackson. Um, there's just a couple of things for housekeeping to close out on. Uh, so for the approved credits, we, these are the credits that we were approved for, for education. Um, again, make sure you fill out that closing um, exit uh, survey that, that you'll see pop up. Don't exit out is the only way I can collect this information so you can get the credits. Um, it just takes a couple minutes to fill it out. Pump you can. We have one more webinar in our fall Carolina Canopy webinar series scheduled for um, the beginning of November. So hopefully you can join us for that one. I'm um, talking about uh, resiliency of our urban ecosystems with Dr. Fair. Uh, and you can just go to our website and, and take a look at that one. We do have two other events that aren't part of the Carolina Canopy webinar series, but more on uh, tree care related um, for arborists and, and landscapers that you might want to check out as well. But I thank everybody for their time today, uh, for attending. Hopefully you found it useful and beneficial. And again, thank you, Dave and Laura, for your time and effort on this. Lots of really cool information and data out there um, for, for folks that are interested. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right, great. So if there's nothing else going on, everybody, you can have a, a wonderful day out there and uh, enjoy the sunshine that is over at least the Raleigh area. Um, and hopefully we'll see you back in November. Bye-bye.